All right, now we finally arrive to the free response section, starting with part B2. These are free response questions that aren't necessarily grouped together. Here you could answer them in any order. They don't follow up with each other. Um, some of them come with prompts, so unlike the other, um, some of the other science regions, they usually come with huge blobs of text. Here in physics, they only come with typically a small paragraph, but that small paragraph is very important to read because it's going to come with important keywords that will help you solve these problems. And so we're going to start with number 51. It's very discreetly at the top. It's hard to um, find sometimes. I almost forget there's a 51. And here, well, they don't have the diagram right on this test booklet, but they have it in the answer booklet. And what they're going to have is a bar magnet like this with a north end and a south end. And it's up to you to sketch at least four magnetic field lines of force around a bar magnet. And so we should know that the field lines for magnetic fields run from north to south. So you just need to draw at least four of them, like this. If you don't have four, you can't get credit, but if you draw it like this, at minimum, that's full credit, that's one point. Number 52. Number 52 through 54 is tied to modern physics. Here we have tritium, um, which is three nucleons, one proton, and two neutrons. It's an isotope of hydrogen. So you're thinking, wait, why is chemistry here? Well, it's tied very heavily in modern physics. Important thing is that it has a proton and two neutrons. And that'll help us for number 52. What is the total number of quarks? Proton is made up of three quarks, and so is a neutron. It's one up, I'm sorry, two up, one down. That's three quarks. A neutron is made up of one up and two down. So they're each made of three quarks. They're baryons. So one proton and two neutrons, three baryons. That's nine quarks altogether. Number 53. What is the total charge in elementary charges of a proton, an electron, and an antineutrino? Okay. So a proton is positive 1e in terms of elementary charge. An electron is negative 1e. An antineutrino okay, is 0e. Well, what's the opposite of 0? It's still 0. There's no actual opposite sign to that. And so the next thing we've got to do is add them all up. Positive 1, negative 1, and 0 still comes out to 0e. And that is our total charge, it's 0e. Number 54, what fundamental interaction is responsible for binding together the protons and neutrons in a helium nucleus? And that there is the strong force. Strong nuclear force. It binds the nucleus together. And that, out of the four fundamental forces, is something I recommend you know by definition. Is the only one I recommend. Strong nuclear force. All right, number 55. Here we have someone tossing a ball horizontally off a cliff. It's not, that's a very small cliff, to be honest. Anyway, it goes a distance of D. Now, what happens when you launch it 20 meters per second? So it's twice as long. So it should go twice as far. And so this now is 2D, and that is our answer. Because the horizontal distance is only affected by the horizontal speed, and if you double the horizontal speed, you get double the horizontal distance. That's it. Now, if you're thinking vertical distance, on the other hand, that's a little different because gravity comes into play there. Um, that's... Oh, something you should calculate yourself just to make sure. All right, now we encounter our first example of a two-point question, number 56 to 57. That means you need to show your work. You need to show the equation, your substitution with units for one point, and the correct answer with units for the other point. All right, 
So here we got a television set drawing a current of one, oh, not one, 0 0.71 amps connected to a 120 volt source outlet. We need to calculate the time while it consumes 3.0 times 10 to the fifth joules of electrical energy. Now the cool thing about this is that, well the easy thing about this for a two point question is that all the equations you're gonna need are all on the reference table. So they're not as bad, you just gotta know which equation to use and they're all in the reference table. They're not gonna ask you to use some random equation to derive it, it's all there. So there is actually an equation that puts this all together. Work is equal to V I T. Okay, and so you're going to just plug all of this in. So 3, oops, 30,000, not 300,000 joules equals 120 volts times 0 0.71 amps times T. You get that time is equal to, you should get exactly 3,521 seconds. Okay, and that is your answer. That's all you need to show for two points. All right, number 50 to 59, we need to draw at least one cycle of a periodic transverse wave with an amplitude of 2.0 centimeters and a wavelength of 6.0 centimeters. I'm going to get the diagram in a bit. All right, so this is what's exactly in the answer booklet. You need to draw one cycle, that means a full wave, with an amplitude. So amplitude has to go from zero and up or zero and down. That's an amplitude. And the wavelength has to be the whole span of a wave, okay? So let's mark this down. So let's make this one, two, negative one, negative two. Let's go like one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay just because I want to stretch it out. So amplitude has to go as high up. And the full wave has to go, that means an up and a down, across six meters. So I'm going to draw it like this. OK. So you can see amplitude goes up as 2 and down as 2. And the whole wave, a full cycle, expands to 6 centimeters like that. That means half a wave occupies three, the other half occupies the back three, just like that. All right, and that's two points. So one point for the correct amplitude and the other point for the correct wavelength. All right, number 60, determine the spring constant of the spring. It's a calculation question, but you don't have to show work, okay? So number 60, oh, let me not do it over there. F S equals K X. They got you the force, and that's the one that's being applied to the spring. It's the weight of the block. Solving for K, the spring constant, and the extension is between these two values here. The difference between 0.15 and 0.25, and that is 0 0.1 meters. K is then 350 newtons per meter. And that is your answer for number 60, 350 newtons per meter. Number 61, we need to determine the amount of matter in kilograms that must be converted to energy to yield one gigajoule. So matter, so mass into energy, that is E equals mc squared. Mass energy equivalence, that's the only time you'll ever use this equation, is to convert from mass to energy. So we're solving for the mass, given the energy, giga is a prefix. So giga, I'm going to put on the other side, giga is a billion. That's 10 to the ninth. Mega is a million, that's 10 to the sixth. So 1 times 10 to the ninth, we're looking for m. C is the speed of light in a vacuum. That's on the front of the reference table. And that's 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. And we have to square that. Don't forget. And that's going to be a really small amount of mass. 
because we're dividing by the square of c. And you should get 1.1 times 10 to the to the negative 8 kilograms. That's really small. It's a small amount of mass to produce 1 billion joules of energy. All right, number 62. Thunder results from the expansion of air as lightning passes through it. The distance between an observer and a lightning strike may be determined if the time that elapses between the observer seeing the lightning and hearing the thunder is known. So there's a difference. We have to explain why we see it before we hear it. And it's simple as light travels faster than sound. All right, now we actually have to calculate the bolt of lightning. Okay, so we got that many coulombs of charge. And we have that voltage. And that s amount of time, that many seconds. Average electric current. So current is I, and that's what we're looking for. So I is equal to simply Q over T. That's a really high current, given that we're dividing by such a small time interval. All right, so let me pull out my calculator. You plug and chug it. And you get a current of 18,666.67 amps. That's really high, just so you know. And then finally, number 65. Here we have two pulses, a crest and a trough, traveling towards each other. And then we have to draw the new results in displacement when they overlap each other at points A and B. All right, now since it's a crest and a trough, this is destructive interference, which means their amplitudes are going to shrink in size. And it's essentially the difference between them, the vector displacement, essentially. Okay, not that this is really a vector, it's really not, but displacement is. Okay, so this one has a displacement of 1.0, and this one has a displacement of negative 0.4. The difference between them is 0.6. And that is the result in displacement. And that's all you have to draw. Okay, just making sure that it's 0 0.6. And that's it. Now, in this next video, we're going to go to part C. And part C now has grouped questions that follow after each other, which is very different from part B, too, where these questions don't necessarily overlap and follow up.